not mean that we're not going to be continuing to uh, acknowledge the social distancing as much as we can, and of course, keeping our hands sanitized and the bathrooms sanitary. So uh, I hope that you're as excited about that as we all are excited we are about that. Excited. Because we are ready to get this show on the road, uh, and we're just going to trust God uh, for what he's going to do. Uh, but Sister Shonda, Sister Hannah, and I are here with Xander. You're not going to be able to see him in the footage, but you'll be able to hear him playing his drums. Uh, we're here to lead you into worship, and then we're going to talk about matters of the heart from the Word of God. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but we, again, want you to worship with us uh, this, uh, as, or this evening, I guess now, and uh, worship in your homes, worship in your car, worship wherever you are, all right? That rhyme, I didn't even mean to do that, but that did rhyme, and so that was nice. I thought it was, I thought it was excellent. Yeah, that was great. Um, but we're going to open up with a word of prayer and ask God to help us, uh, to be with us through the evening. Uh, again, everybody just stop what you're doing right now, especially New Destiny. Share, 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 share the video, and then just sit down, get your Bibles out, get your notebooks out, and then uh, let's, let's just see what God would have for us tonight, all right? So so this is not a time for you to, uh, to to be up and walking around the kitchen and all that stuff. Again, acknowledge this as service time. So just calm down, relax, all right? Go turn the stove off if you have to. Get the kids all together. Sit down with them. Let's worship together. Let's hear from the Word of God. If you're in your homes with your children, pray with your kids. You may, not, you may never know. One of your children might receive the Holy Ghost tonight. Uh, right in your home. So let's just ask God to be with us here in this building and at your home. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for the honor and the opportunity we have to be here. We thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. We thank you, God, for who you are to us, in us, through us, God. Lord, we thank you for this moment, God. Now we pray that you would have your way. Do what you desire, Lord. Let the will of God be done in this place, even as it is in the heavens, Lord. Let the glory of God rain down upon us. Let the power of God be made manifest among us, oh God. Just have your way, Lord. Move according to your good pleasure. For, Lord, we are here on business with the King, Lord. God, I pray for myself that you would forgive me of any sin committed, past, present, known, or unknown. Wash me by the blood that nothing in me would hinder what you would do in this place. But, Lord, have free reign, oh God. God. Lord, heal somebody tonight. Destroy yoke tonight, God. Lord, fill somebody with the Holy Ghost, Lord God. Make a way, God, where there seemed to be no way for somebody in this house tonight. And for it, we're going to give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. We are going to worship God tonight. We're going to ask the Lord to have his way and to move among us according to his good pleasure. Amen. Xander's playing gopher tonight, too, so <laughs> he's going to be going for a lot of things. All right, whenever you all are ready. You all know this one.
verses in there last week. Woo, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
praise God. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. All right. Amen. Well, it is good to be standing behind this pulpit again, and uh, I feel like it has been way too long personally, <laughs> uh, but I thank God for his goodness and his mercy um, and for the loving kindness of the Lord that he shows to us and he gives to us, and uh, we thank God for it. I pray that, um, I pray that you have been blessed tonight uh, and that God has helped you so far in the worship. I do apologize for the sound being a little bit low at first. Um, you know, this Mevo camera is kind of a up and down thing. Sometimes it sounds great, sometimes it's too loud. But I want to talk to you about the heart tonight. And if you watched my video on uh, this afternoon, uh, you'll know where I'm headed. Uh, if you did not, I want to remind us, uh, sometimes sometimes we use the statement, God knows my heart, and it's a cop-out. It's an easy way out uh, of guilt. It's an easy way out of embarrassment. It's really an easy way out of conviction. Uh, I think the most disturbing part is that even though people are saying it maybe without, uh, uh, without really being serious about it, uh, that God does know our heart. And the prophet said that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then the Lord responds and says, I, the Lord, uh, know the heart uh, and I try the reins. And so uh, the Lord knows our hearts. And uh, in fact, when, when Noah was, uh, had just come out of the flood, the waters had uh, receded. Uh, he brought in a, a animals of all the clean animals and he made sacrifice unto the Lord. He built an altar and made sacrifice to the Lord and the Bible said that a sweet smelling savor went up before the Lord and the Lord made a covenant and a promise with the land and he said I will not I will not uh, more or less charge the land or curse the land for the sake of man he said because the, 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 the imaginations of the heart of man is evil from his youth and uh, so we understand uh, the heart of man. We understand uh, what's in the heart of man. Um, and, and, and there are things in our hearts that maybe we don't want dealt with because it's easier uh, for us to just ignore them. Uh, that's the reason why people get into all kinds of distractions, whether it be from addictions to bad relationships uh, to busyness. Uh, sometimes our addiction is busyness because we don't want God to deal with our hearts. Um, we stay away from church. Uh, we, we try not to hear a word that will convict us. We try not to hear a word that will challenge us. Uh, in fact, a lot of people will, will stay away from things like that uh, because in our hearts, uh, our hearts are evil and desperately wicked. Uh, but saints of God, God has a fix for the heart. Um, in fact, he said that I'm going to take out of you the stony heart and I'm going to put into you a heart of flesh. And the heart is really where all the matters of life come from. Uh, it's not necessarily my neighbor, my brother, my sister, my siblings, uh, my mother, my father. Uh, it's not in my spouse, uh, my children, uh, my co-workers. Uh, the problems of all of our life exist within our hearts. And that's the reason why the writer tells us to keep our hearts with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And out of the heart comes forth the issues of our life. Uh, in fact, the Bible said, uh, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so uh, it's not sufficient enough just to say, God knows my heart. We also have to do personal inventory and make sure that we understand what is in our heart. And you don't have to go past your mouth most of the time to hear what's in your heart. Uh, but many times we don't stop to listen to the words of our mouth 
in order to be able to understand what is in our heart. And so we're, we're, we're self-defeatist, uh, we're self-hating, we hate other people, we're rebellious, uh, uh, we're, 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 we're uh, depressed, frustrated, bitter. Uh, all of these things reside within the heart of man. And most of the time, if we listen to the words we speak, we'll find out really what is inside of our heart. And, and our actions show our heart as well. In fact, Jesus said uh, to, to, to those religious of his day, he said, you dress up the outside of the cup, you clean up the outside of the cup. But he said, inwardly, uh, you're full of excess and you're full of extortion. And so ultimately, uh, if we're not careful, uh, what is in our heart uh, is going to come out in our actions. Uh, and so uh, I, I want to talk about that tonight. And I'm going to use a passage that we're all very, very familiar with. Uh, I want you to go with me to Matthew 26. Y'all pray for my tablet. It has been in rebellion all day long. It needs help from the Lord, or maybe it just needs to be the screen to be clean. But here in Matthew 26, uh, and of course, uh, in verse 36, uh, the Bible said, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And so he tells uh, uh, the few to stay, uh, and then he looks at Peter, uh, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. So here there's eight there uh, waiting on him. Three have come with him. And he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. In other words, he began to feel the emotion of what was coming on him. Then he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. He said, Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And so he's dealing with emotions he's, and he's dealing with his will. Now, in all of us, we have emotions, we have will, we have intellect. And these three are not always in agreement. <laughs> these three are not always in unity. Have you ever had somebody look at you and say, you know what, your mouth talks faster than your brain thinks. Because ultimately, uh, your, your emotions, you're heated, you're angry, you're frustrated, or even excited. And you begin to just run your mouth off. And you begin to talk. You begin to just say whatever you, whatever, whatever comes to your, to, to your lips, you, it comes out of your mouth. And by the time you're done, especially if it's in an argument or a disagreement with someone that you love, with, with someone that you care about, what normally is left but devastation and damage. Because before you allowed your intellect to engage, you were ruled by your emotions. And so in all of us, there are emotions. And emotions are not evil within themselves. It is how we deal with emotion as to whether it is evil or not. And here Jesus is dealing with his emotions and he is dealing with his will. He's sorrowful. Uh, another scripture declares here in Hebrews 5, if you go with me to Hebrews 5, and we're going to go through a few scriptures here, but I want you to hang with me for a few moments. Here, Hebrews 5, verse 5. Now we'll give you a second to get there. But I really want us to engage our hearts. And I can't do that for you. I, I can't see what's in your heart. The Bible said, no man knoweth the heart of man save the spirit of the man that is within him. So that means that you know your own heart. And sometimes we deceive ourselves. Sometimes we, 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 we honestly know what's in our heart, but we deceive ourselves because we're looking to be a, a better person than we think we are or than we know we are. And so we deceive ourselves with words and with actions. But here the Bible said, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. But he, he that said unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who in the days of his flesh, he's talking about the Lord. 
who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. So here, these disciples that he took with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, they heard that he was afraid. He offered strong crying and tears. He was afraid. He was dealing with the emotion of fear. And also he's dealing with the battle of will. Now, what helps us in the battle of emotion and will? Because you can be a willful person and have an evil heart. Have you ever met someone that was hell-bent on destroying themselves? And no matter what wisdom was put in front of them, they were just determined to do things their own way. And it wasn't because they were thinking clearly. It wasn't because they were heeding to the wisdom that was given. It was because they were willful. Have you ever had a little toddler? Uh, Sister Shonda and I have a little grandson. And he is willful. He is very willful. And so he wants to do things that he should not do or that is not okay for him doing because he could hurt himself, because he could damage himself and maybe even kill himself if you let him go too far. He's willful. When, 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 he, when, when, the, when the, the, the main door of the house is open and the screen door is there, the first thing he wants to do is go outside. Well, if we allowed his will, his desire to go outside, if we just allowed him to be run by his will, he would run out into the street and get hit by a car because he doesn't have the wisdom and the understanding necessary to guide his will. So he's willful, but he's not willful uh, to, his, to his safety. He's not willful uh, to, to, to his own uh, help. He's willful to his own demise. And there are a lot of God's people that are willful, but they have no wisdom. And so they're so willful. They're going to do things their way. They're going to have it their way. They're going to they're going to accomplish life their way. They're not asking the Lord. They're not inquiring of the Lord. And I've had so many of them tell me, well, I prayed. My question is, what did you pray? And most of the time their prayer is God, do what I want. Lord, do what's in my will, not God. What is your will? It's Lord. This is what I want out of my life. This is the plan I have for my life. And that's what I want you to do. And so regardless of what God's plan is or what God's will is, they're going to do things their way because they're willful. They're willful without wisdom. And so, 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 so we can allow many things to control us in our life. We can allow our emotions have you ever met someone who's hot-headed? Who, uh, it takes me a while to get angry, and when I get angry, I get angry. But other people, it may take them a split second to get just viciously angry, to get just enraged. And what do they not have? They do not have the fruit of the Spirit working in their life to help them with temperance, to help them to control their emotions. And so people who are emotionally volatile, what do they do? They oftentimes cause more destruction in their life than they do cause hope and peace and joy because they are governed by their emotions. Being governed by your will and your emotions are both dangerous to you. They're deadly to you. And somebody said, well, I'm just following my heart. That's a horrible thing to do. Following your heart is a bad thing. You don't know how many people I have stood over uh, in a wedding and, and, and asked this person, are you sure this is what you want to do? Because we take the covenant of marriage very seriously in this church. And so I say, are you sure? I mean, have you prayed? Do you know this is the will of God? I, I've just got to follow my heart on this one. And it's not many years there in the divorce court. Why? Because they were governed by their emotions. They were in just this fairy tale love with this individual. And so they had to have this individual. They, they just had to because their emotions 
were, were raging out of control and they didn't have any wisdom to govern their emotions. And when their emotions got to such a height, their will kicked in and it didn't matter what wisdom was put in front of them. They were going to do what they were going to do no matter what, because they did not see what was in their heart. They did not see what was driving their decision. They were being driven by an emotion. They were being driven by an, an, an ungoverned will. But they were never ever accessing the wisdom of God. And I'm going to ask you children of God, what is in your heart? And what drives these kind of decisions? What drives us to be highly emotional? And we have to find that out. Some people are terrified of loneliness. And so when they find someone that pays them attention, immediately, that's got to be the one. Some people are terrified of, of trying to accomplish success in their life by themselves. And so as soon as they find someone that they think can help them achieve their goals, bam, they connect to that person and that's got to be the one. Some people were wounded by, uh, uh, by, by a husband or by a fiance or by a significant other. And, and they've been wounded. And so they, they find someone. Uh, and by the way, saints of God, if you buy what they're selling on this side of the ring, you're going to be sadly disappointed when you wake up with the ring on because the person most likely they're selling is not the person you're going to wake up to. All right. Everybody puts on their best foot, but you don't smell their morning breath until the next day. OK, so if you buy them based upon what they're selling up front, you're going to be disappointed. So you have to be very careful what's driving that emotion. I talk today about people who are, are so caught up in, in, in philanthropy. They, 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 they're doing all these good things, but they're doing it in the public eye. They're, they're taking cameras and recording their good deeds. They're, they're, they're taking pictures of their good deeds. When the Bible said to do those things in secret and your father shall reward you openly. But somewhere along the line in that person's life, they have felt unfulfilled and they have maybe felt uh, uh, unworthy or they have felt that they didn't get enough praise for their, from their parents or enough praise from their peers. And so they, they, they prop up their, their good deeds so that people will give them the applause. And Jesus said, by the way, they have their reward because no child of God should be videoing their good deeds or taking pictures of their good deeds. If it's a good deed, just do it and God will reward you. At the return of Jesus Christ, you don't have to let everybody else know what you're doing, but that's what social media, the evil of social media. And so, so what causes us, what causes us to get on social media with our authentic selves and be completely fake? What drives that in us? Because we're, we're so afraid people won't accept the real us. That we, that we put on this image on social media that we think everybody will love. We've been rejected. We've been ostracized. We've been made fun of and ridiculed. And so we want to project the image that this culture will love. And so your clothes, your personality, uh, your verbiage, everything about you changes with the current of the culture. And when something new comes out, you adapt yourself to that, not because you're being real, but because you want people to accept you. That's the reason why people take selfies and then go on all day long trying to see how many likes they have because they themselves are crying out for the affirmation that only Jesus Christ himself can give or they're vain. They're, they're, they're arrogant. They're prideful. They're stuck on themselves and they want people to applaud the person they look in the mirror every day and applaud. What's in our hearts? What's driving the church to a place where the apostasy that is reigning in the house of God is so easily consumed. What's driving us to the place where we hate conviction, where we despise chastening? What's in our heart that we reject rebuke and reproof? And the only thing we'll accept is praise and affirmation. What's driving us to this? What's driving preachers to preach Doctrine that's going to send the whole congregation to hell. What drives us to do that? Knowing what we're doing. What's driving us to do that? 
What is it our need for public approval? Is it our need for is it our need for a congregational applause? Have we somewhere been so rejected that we're willing to pay whatever cost comes along in order to get the public affirmation that we feel like we have been uh, that we've been uh, 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 defrauded of? What is in our hearts, saints of God? What what causes people in this generation to be so dissatisfied in marriage? Is it selfishness? Is it self uh, absorption where everything has to be about us and everything has to be our way and everything has to be done the way we would do it or else the person that we're living with. By the way, if you wanted to marry yourself, you should have had a single reception. You should have been there by yourself, made your own punch, baked your own cake and invited everybody. When you marry someone else, you marry someone who's not like you. You marry someone different than you. So what causes us to be so, so, so volatile in marriage that we don't even take the covenant of marriage seriously? What causes women to run after other men's husbands or other women's husbands? And what causes men to run after other men's wives? What causes these things? What causes men to be insatiable in sexual lust? What causes women to be insatiable in sexual lust? What is in our heart? And that's where we're, 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 we're defrauding ourselves and we're defrauding whole congregations because we, we think that God needs us to make him look good. We think that the church has to be so pristine. But I'm telling you, how can it be pristine when there's so much filth in our hearts? Before we can make the church this sparkling clean entity that we desired, we first must first get down into the dirt of our hearts. And it has to start in the heart. We can't start necessarily in the outward. We have to start in the heart. Now, I am not against people having dress standards in their church. That, that's, that's, that's between that pastor and God. That, that I, have no, I have nothing to say about that. What, what you do in your church, you do in your church. But I have been in churches where people could go to nightclubs and sing and they could sleep with people outside of marriage. They could fornicate. They could meet up with people in hotels and at, at conventions. But as long as they came to church that next day and had their skirt right, right where it needs to be and their facial hair exactly what it needs to be and their long sleeve white shirts and all that, that they were that they that everybody looked past their heart because they couldn't see their heart past their clothes. But Jesus said, you clean up the outside of the cup, but inwardly you're full of excess and extortion. What we have to do is go down to the heart because the heart is where the problem is. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus had any of these issues because he didn't. But I'm showing you that Jesus himself struggled with emotions and will. But there was something in his spirit. There's something he knew that drove him beyond his struggle with the emotions and will. It was what he knew. Now, I want to tell you this. There are another there are others of us that are intellectual. Now, I'm not claiming to be one, but there are some that are and they're intellectual and they're thinkers. But if you're intellectual, but you don't have grasp of your emotions, you're intellectual, but you don't have grasp of your will. Then you're just as dangerous as the person who does not have grasp on their will, their emotions, or their intellect. Because you're going to make intellectual decisions and have no faith. You're going to make intellectual decisions unemotionally. And God gave us our emotions for a reason. He gave us our emotions. Uh, here I was uh, uh, singing up here uh, with uh, Sister Shana and Sister Hannah and, and tears were coming down my eyes. Why? Because I felt the Lord. I was emotional. I felt emotion and I responded to my emotion. So you can be very intellectual and, and, and unemotional and be untouched by the Lord. I've had people tell me, well, I can't worship like that because that's just not my personality. I want you to understand sacrifice of praise. Praise is sacrificial. Praise is not something that you can give God. Praise is not something that you set the terms on. Praise is something that God has said, this is how I want you to worship me. And then beyond your personality, you praise him anyways. 
Beyond your personality, you clap your hands anyways. Beyond your personality, you dance before the Lord anyways. Beyond your personality, you lift up your hands and you lift up your voice in the sanctuary and you bless his name because it's not about your personality. It's not about your intellectualism. It is about God setting the standard of worship. And the last time I checked, I don't get to set the terms on anything that pertains to the will of God. It's his way or my way. So I, I'm an intellectual. I don't see the need in emotional worship. And so I become willful. And I say, I don't care what God requires. That's not who I am. That's not how I do it. And that's not how I'm going to do it. And so my intellectualism has produced a will that is without control. And I'm not being any better than the person who is their emotions at unchecked so Jesus is here and he's suffering with fear he's suffering with fear and he's struggling with his will now I know preachers say I don't believe the Lord did that you can say whatever you want that's what the Bible said you can't twist it you can't turn it you can't pretty it up and by the way the Lord does not need me to go on a public campaign to protect his image he put himself in the word he is the word God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's talking about. So I don't need to protect Jesus' personal image, all right? He's good at that by himself, and he's great enough to absolutely protect himself. So he doesn't need that for me. So I don't need to dress up a Jesus that doesn't exist. I need to just produce the Jesus that is in the Word. And so here he is. He's struggling with fear. He's struggling with his will. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane struggling with his heart. He's dealing with matters of his heart. So how did Jesus overcome his fear? How did he overcome his will? The first thing we ought to ask is, what did Jesus know? What did he know? Well, go with me to John 18 and verse 33. second to get there. The Bible said, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it, of, tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. He said, in other words, my kingdom is not here. He knew something before him. He knew some hope he had before him. Going back to John 17, Father, glorify me with thine own self with the glory that I had with thee before the world was. There was a kingdom that was coming, and he said, it's not here now. So Jesus knew something ahead of him. He had hope ahead of him. Pilate therefore said unto him, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. He said, to this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. He said, I know what is ahead of me. He said, to this end, I was born to sit on the throne of my father, David. That is the whole purpose of who I am. I am to be king of kings and Lord of lords. That is why I was born. Now, let's keep going on. Matthew uh, 12 and verse 40. Jesus said this, Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He knew he was going to be buried. He knew he was going to one day reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, but before that he was going to be buried. Now go with me to John uh, 2 and verse 19.
Let's start at verse 18. He said, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Go with me to Luke 19. And verse 21. That is not what I'm looking for. So I wrote it down wrong. Just one second. Luke 9. And verse 21. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. So let's follow this. He goes before Pilate and Pilate said, Are you a king? Jesus says, to this end was I born. And for this whole purpose, this is the whole purpose I came into the world. But then he says, before I can become king, I must go into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Just as Jonas went in the belly of the well. But before I can go into the heart of the earth, I must be rejected. I must be slain. Before I can even be raised the third day. Because you're going to destroy this temple, my body. But in three days, it's going to be raised up again. So Jesus had all this understanding. He had all this knowledge, all of these things that we have talked about. Jesus understood and knew long before he went before Pilate. He knew it long before the, 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 the scribes and the Pharisees rejected him and tortured him and put him to death. He knew it long before saints of God. He was ever to become king of kings and lord of lords. And he knew it before he went to the garden of Gethsemane. But there was something inside of him called fear. And it, he was struggling. That fear was producing a struggle in his will. But something gave him the power to overcome his will and his emotions. And that was the word of God. It is what he knew from the word of God that gave him power to overcome his will and his emotions. It gave him power to conform his will, to transform his mind, and to mold his heart. Children of God, we have exceeding and precious promises before us. I want to ask you, what is in your heart that has made the people of God respond in such terror to the pandemic that we have faced, even though the deaths have been artificially inflated? The deaths are not near as what they're saying it is, but everybody, no matter if they died of a heart attack, they died of kidney failure, liver failure, if they were diagnosed with a COVID-19 diagnosis, they were declared dead of the coronavirus. We don't even know how many people died of this. But centuries before until now, during times of crisis, war, pandemic, plague, pestilence, the children of God were the ones that rose up in the middle of it and stood like a mighty rock, stood like a mighty tree, planted by the rivers of water. And none of those things moved them. In fact, at one point, said, Paul said, none of these things moved me. He said, neither counted I my life so dear unto myself that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry that has been given unto me. Children of God, we have got to start looking in our hearts. Why am I responding to life the way I am? Why instead of me staying in the church? Let me tell you something. Most people don't stay in the church long enough to change. That we're in a microwave age where we want, to, we want an instant fix. And it has to feel good. We put God, and I don't want to say we actually put God uh, in, in, in this box 
or in a bind because God's never in a box or in a bind. What we do is we put ourselves in a bind because we say, God, you have this much time to change me, but it has to feel like this because we're living with an addicted generation. And it's not that they're addicted to opioids. Listen, all, drug addiction is only a symptom of a problem in a heart. We could outlaw all drugs and people would find a way to get high. People say we need more gun control. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. You can outlaw all the guns. Not one of those hijackers that, that I understand in 9-11 had a gun on them. They had box cutters. And they took over planes and they used them as missiles to take down buildings and to kill people. They didn't have guns and box cutters, but the box cutter doesn't have a heart. The box cutter doesn't have emotions. The box cutter doesn't have a will. The box cutter doesn't have an intellect. We can blame whatever we want. We can blame everybody. And so we say, God, look here. You've got this much. Time. If I don't see a difference in me and if I don't feel better within this certain amount of time, I'm done with this church stuff. The problem is you don't understand transformation and change because transformation and change isn't always in the tulip field, dancing through the tulips with gumdrops falling out of the sky. Transformation is painful at times because in order to be transformed, you have to face yourself. And the very reason you were getting high, the very reason you were getting drunk, the very reason why your sex life was out of control is because you were running from yourself and people come to the church and they want us to put a blindfold on. They want God to put a blindfold on and they use church as a drug fix. But church is not here to make you feel better. Church is here to transform you into the image of Jesus Christ. It is to present you a chaste virgin. And sometimes that means it's going to be painful. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and every son he receives, he scourges. The reason why we're looking for a fix is because we don't want to have to deal with our heart. Because really we know our hearts. Really we know our hearts. I tell people all the time, you don't have to tell people really where they are. Because most people know it even if they're in denial. And the only reason why they're in denial is because they're denying what they already know. What's in our hearts? They're deceitful. They're desperately wicked. And so when we're out in willful rebellion, and we use this term, but God knows my heart, you're almost blaspheming. You're almost taking your willful rebellion and shoving it in the face of God, daring him to do something. Because a loving God wouldn't do anything like that. My Jesus wouldn't do anything like that. Because he knows my heart. Child of God, you're setting yourself up for destruction. In order for us to change and to transform to be like Christ, we have to die to ourselves. We have to die to our intellect. In other words, I don't care if you're the most intelligent person in the world. When you come to the church, you don't know anything. That's hard for people to accept. That's hard for highly educated people to accept. So what do we have? We have an entire generation of college-educated students who come into the church and they put a hook in the nose of the preachers and the ministry leaders and they run them around and tell them what, how they want church to be, the messages they want them to preach and the, how they're going to reach them. Because these are intellectuals. These are enlightened people. But I'm going to tell you something, child of God. I've been preaching this gospel for 23 years. And if someone comes in here with a PhD straight up out of the world, they don't know anything. They're a baby in Christ. They're, they're just an infant. So I wouldn't let anyone coming in from who, who has not been serving God faithfully and dedicatedly have the kind of influence that people want immediately when they walk through the doors. Because we have an entire generation of people who have been telling their parents what to do, who've been telling their teachers what to do, who've been telling their professors what to do, and who most likely have been telling their bosses what to do, which maybe is not as accurate because I would fire them. 
They're so used to telling people what to do because they're intellectual, they're intelligent. But they don't have any governance over their will or their emotions. And so they make reckless decisions because they think information is all you need to make a decision. But really, your intellect, your will, and your emotions all have to line up. And that can only happen if your focus is on the Word of God. So what's in your heart? What's in your heart? I, I hear people, they blame everybody for their bad decisions. Blame everybody for their sin. You ever, you ever been around somebody that shouldn't have done what they did, but it wasn't their fault? I know what I did was wrong, but it's not my fault. Those people are running away from the responsibility that they themselves have acquired because they did not keep their heart. And so instead of them having to face themselves and say, you know what, I sinned and I am ashamed and I, I, I'm convicted and I need to repent. You know what they do? They run around and they blame their spouse. They blame their parents. They blame their children and they blame the preachers. Because though they shouldn't have done what they did, it wasn't their fault. Let them get fired from a job. You know what they do? They blame their boss. Their boss, all their bosses are mean to them. I mean, everybody, every, all their bosses. I mean, all their bosses. They've never had a boss that actually cared about them. They did for a while, but then they were mean to them. All of this stuff is nonsense. That has to go away when you take an honest look inside of your heart. And you say, wow, Lord, as David said, you remember David when he had Uriah killed and he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and got her pregnant? David was not a dumb man. He was a very intelligent individual. And so instead of him dealing with his emotions and his intellect and facing himself, he devises this incredible plan that he's going to invite Uriah off the battlefield to come spend time with his wife. He believes that when Uriah spends time with his, li his wife, that, that Uriah and Bathsheba will have relations and they will produce a child that really belonged to David. But see, when God is after you, and we all better pray that God loves us enough to do what he did for David. This was the sure mercy of David. Sometimes, I, I want to tell you, mercy is not God overlooking our sin. Mercy is rather God exposing our sin and then giving us the space to repent. That's mercy. We think mercy is God. We think mercy is God's get out of jail free card. That's not mercy. Because guess what's going to happen? If God doesn't correct that behavior, guess what's going to happen? You're going to go right back to it over and over and over again. And so David says, you know what? I've got this plan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite Uriah off the battlefield. Uh, him and his wife, they'll have relations. And then we'll say that child belongs to them. Uriah comes home and says, there's no way. There is no way that my brethren are going to be in battle. And I'm going to come home and spend time with my wife. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go sleep in the gate. David's in trouble now. Because... God has put it in the heart of Uriah to stay away from his wife because God's going to expose David's sin. God's going to show mercy to David. He's going to confront him. So David is in a panic. He's, he's, he's freaking out. What am I going to do? So he comes up with this incredible idea. Again, intellectual, but he doesn't have his will and his emotions under control. He is not using self-control. So he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go. And, and I'm going I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell them when the battle gets real hot, in the heat of the battle, that they're all to pull away from Uriah. And he'll die. And no one will ever know what happened. The problem is, as intellectual as David was, he forgot there was a God who could, you could hide nothing from. And see, there's so many of God's people running around in willful rebellion that think they're hiding. Deny, 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 deny. Hide, 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 hide. Deny, 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 deny. Hide, 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 hide. But if God loves you, child of God, the Holy Ghost is going to tell on you. You're not going to get away with it. And God's going to confront it until it changes. He's going to confront it until the behavior stops. And so God says, no, we're not going to do that. Bathsheba has the child. 
and a length of time goes by. This child is not little baby. There's a good time goes by here. The child is weaned from its mother. And so I'm sure David thought in his heart because God hasn't done anything about it. Now I've gotten by with this. That is the unintended consequence of God's long suffering. The unintended consequence of God's long suffering is the wicked rebellion in our heart. The Bible said it is because his judgments are not executed speedily that men's hearts are hardened. So David, I'm sure, thinks I got by with this. No one's ever going to know. And he has this child. He marries Bathsheba. Everything's great. It's all covered. But God didn't forget. God saw what happened. And he never forgot. And so Nathan the prophet comes to David and he gives them this, this illustration of this one man who has this one little ewe lamb and he loves that ewe lamb and he cherishes it and he takes care of it. He provides it, he watches over it and then there's this shepherd with all these, this great amount of sheep and the shepherd with the sheep becomes envious of the man with the ewe lamb and he kills the man and steals the ewe lamb and David is angry because it's been so long since he got caught. He didn't realize he was the shepherd that murdered the man for the ewe lamb. And he began to look at other people. Because David never dealt with that in his heart. He never ever dealt with it in his heart. And Nathan looks at him and says, you're the man. And I'm going to tell you why God loved David. God didn't love David because David threw his sin in God's face and dared him to do something about it. He didn't. God didn't love David because David had determined that God was going to forever be merciful for him, merciful to him and show grace to him forever. And nothing could ever happen to him because he served such a loving and wonderful God. Really, a lot of people that preach that are running away from their own sin. They won't repent of. I'm telling you the facts, whether we like it or not. Because they don't trust God to forgive them and change them. As if somehow now God has lost all power to deliver people from sin and the power of it. We serve a powerless God. The, the modern gospel preaches a powerless God. And so the only thing he can do about it is just show us this unlimited grace and, you know, we'll make it. Because, I mean, he ain't got no power to change people. What a sorry state the church has come into. Such a victim mentality. When we're supposed to be more than conquerors. You know what, David didn't say, God, you know my heart. Yeah, I shouldn't have killed Uriah. Yeah, I shouldn't have slept with Bathsheba. But God, you know my heart. In fact, God said, I have found me a man after my own heart. David gets in sackcloth and ash. He develops the posture of repentance. He doesn't go boast in his sin. He doesn't pridefully and arrogantly bumble around. Because nobody can do anything about it. He develops the posture of repentance. And he clothes himself in sackcloth. And he takes off his kingly retire. Because at this point it wasn't about King David. At this point it was about David. It wasn't about his position. It was about his soul. It was about his heart. And that's where we hear that beautiful song. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew the right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We're going to have to deal with our hearts at some point. Why, is there, why has there been so much immorality amongst ministry? What's wrong with our hearts? What are the unresolved issues that are in our hearts that we're not dealing with? Why is there so much unfaithfulness in the church and rebellion against authority? What is it in our heart that we haven't dealt with? Why is there so much rebellion in our homes? And why aren't parents disciplining their children? What's in our hearts? What ugly is in our hearts that's causing us to be so self-centered that we don't care the outcome of those around us because we don't want to have to deal with the battle? What's in our hearts? Because that's not about a love for others. That's about a love for ourselves. 
What's wrong with pastors that we can't rebuke and reprove? What's wrong with pastors that we can't confront and hold people accountable? What's wrong with us that we've spent generations sweeping stuff under the carpet until the rug is to the ceiling? What's in our hearts? Because that wasn't a love for the people that created that. There was something wrong in our hearts. And if the church is going to come out of this coronavirus and be strong and powerful and mighty, and we are, by the grace of God, we're going to do it because our hearts are right. And I know a lot of people have maybe been fearful. I've tried to teach and teach and teach and teach and teach over this past few weeks that God has the control of death and that our days are appointed, that God is in control and God is in control. And even though I preach God is in control, most people think that they have the power to escape the coronavirus. That the government has the wisdom to keep them from the coronavirus. I talked to you Sunday about why have we bypassed men of God to take counsel from the world. There are people that made decisions based upon their helping at the church never even talked to me. Never even counseled with me. They just made the decision that was it. What's in our hearts? What's in our hearts? What's in our hearts that, that, that churches are struggling and not, not, not necessarily this one right now, but churches are struggling with attendance from faithful members? What's in our heart? What's in our heart that people rob from God in their tithes and offerings? These are all symptomatic of greater problems in the heart. And if the church is going to come out of this strong, we're going to have to get down in the dirt and deal with the filth in our own hearts. What causes us to want to continue to engage music we shouldn't listen to, watch movies we shouldn't, watch television shows we shouldn't? What, what causes us to go past what we know to be true and to willfully rebel even though we know the consequences? When really our love for the hope that God has given to us and the God that gave it to us should propel us past our own willful rebellion. But we're going to do what we're going to do anyways. What is in the church now that obedience and submission have become the four letter words of the church? The curse words, the profanity. What is in our hearts? Because the problem is not it's not everybody else. Jared has to look at himself and say, what's the problem with your heart? You child of God, God, look at yourself and say, what's in my heart? Why is the word of God no longer enough for me? Why do I have to have something else? Why do I have to counsel with worldly counsel when the Bible said, blessed is the man that standeth not in the counsel of the ungodly? Or walking not in the counsel of the ungodly. What, what, is, what is in our hearts that no matter what we know, we will not control our emotions? That people know what is right, but they choose to do what is wrong because they're out of control in their will and their emotions are high. And they just justify it by saying, God knows my heart. We don't have an other people problem. The church is filled with heart disease. We have a heart problem. We have a heart problem that we can't be told what to do. We have a heart problem that everywhere we go, we have to be in charge of something. We have a heart problem. We have a heart problem. We have a heart problem that we have to jump from place to place in order to be pacified. There's a heart problem. And the only way for us to find any help is to take the word of God and apply it to our heart. And that's what I'm going to try to do the rest of this week. I really want to deal with the heart. And I hope I've helped you tonight. Because you have to understand it is what Jesus knew. It is what he knew that was before him. The Bible said he endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. I want to challenge you children of God. To really begin to engage your hope. To really again begin to realize what is before you. To really fall in love once again with the Lord. To the point that you're willing to obey him at any cost. That you finish your course with joy. 
and the ministry that is before you. Why? Because none of these things move you. Neither count you your life so dear to yourself. We've got to start dealing with our hearts. Whether we want to or not, we've got to start dealing with the heart of the matter. Because these are matters of the heart. I want to challenge you tonight to get really, really sincere with the Lord and honest and transparent and say, God, deal with my heart. Change my heart. Deliver me from what's within my heart. Make a way for me. Because we can't, saints of God, we can't change our heart. But he can take out of us the stony heart, the rebellious, stubborn, willful heart, and he can put us put in us a heart of flesh. And when he puts that heart of flesh in us, he's going to write his laws. He's going to write his word on our hearts and in our minds. And David said, that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Because putting the word of God in your heart will keep you from the rebellion of sin against God. God has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness. And we are without excuse. We must at this point challenge ourselves. No matter where we're at, no matter where we're from, no matter what our history is, no matter what our relationship history is, we must challenge ourselves now, moving forward, to deal with the matters of our heart. Because out of the heart flows the issues of life. Saints of God, what's defiling you is not outside of you. Well, it's my husband, and if he would have, it's my wife, and if she would have, it's my children, if they would have. What's making you angry What's causing you to run violently off at the mouth? What's causing some of you to be abusive in your relationships? What's causing many of us to lose jobs and, 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 and to lose everything that God would bless us with? It's not outside of us. Jesus said it's not what goes into a man that defiles what's come out. It is inside. It is a matter of the heart. And I'm asking you, pleading with you, get real with God. Be transparent before the Lord. And let's work out these matters of the heart. And I'm going to tell you, saints, if we get the heart right, something on the inside is going to come on the outside. And oh, what a change will be in my life. Amen. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope that it has touched your heart and your mind. Uh, we will be back in here Sunday at 11 o'clock. Uh, and some of you may still be timid. You know, you need to pray and ask God to help you. But we're going to be in here at 11 o'clock Sunday. And we're inviting you to come and be with us. And let's worship. Let's magnify the name of the Lord. And let's let the rafters ring in this place with the praises of our God. Amen. I believe God will do great things among us. All right. 11 o'clock Sunday. We're going to be back here. All right. All right. I'm going to ask Hannah to come up one more time. Ask Shauna to come one more time. We're going to sing one more song, and then we are going to go for the evening, and uh, we'll see you guys Sunday at 11. So if you want to give at this time, you can pull up your Give Levi app, and you can uh, give your tithes, you can give your offerings. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, give, you can also send a check or money order by mail to PO Box 683, Kingsport, Tennessee 37662, to just help this ministry. I thank God for all of you who have given so faithfully and supported the work of God, it has been a tremendous encouragement to me to see how God has touched your hearts and your 
minds and your lives, and you have given so faithfully. This has been an amazing thing for me to see. Amazing thing. So we're doing our offering song. So if you want to give while we're singing, please feel free. Father, we pray for Sister Shirley. Do the same for her, healing and strengthening. 
Father, Lord, we pray for Brother Al that you would touch him. God, strengthen him, uplift him, God. Let him know that you're with him. Sister Donna, God, strengthen her body, God. Lord, heal her, God. Lord, God, we believe you right now to do a miracle for your saints as you send forth your word to heal their disease, God. Now, God, show yourself strong to your people. Be with us the rest of this week, God. Bring us back again at the next appointed time, and we're going to rejoice before the God of our salvation. For we know it is him that makes all things possible. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Go with God's saints. Have a great rest of the week. We'll see you guys Sunday.